Well, howdy doody, guys. Great to see you and thank you for gracing my garden hut once again. The Holy Shed, the littlest parish in the world. Well, maybe, as far as I know. <laughs> Actually, I say it's the littlest, but what amazes me week in, week out is just how many of you come here from all over. How many people seem to have found a home, a spiritual home here in the shed. Uh, every week I get messages from folks saying that it's kind of where they feel they belong now, which is amazing. And what truly lifts my spirit is when some of you have said that you'd given up on church altogether or that you'd never, you would never dream of going to church anyway, but you kind of rolled up here somehow or other and you found somewhere. How good is that? Considering that no one ever even planned to do this, uh, I think that's amazing. Mind you, I think I'm learning not to plan too much this year. Well, I think we all are, aren't we? I had lots of plans at the beginning of 2020, all sorts of stuff that was going to be happening. And basically it all went by the board. And uh, sometimes life's like that, which is what actually this book is all about, which uh, I don't know, I just I saw it again this week. I've I bought it quite some time back now and it has the delightful title. We plan God laughs what to do when life hits you over the head, which I think is definitely what's happened to the world in 2020. Uh, it's a great title, though, isn't it? It's an old Yiddish poem, actually, uh, proverb. We plan, God laughs. And it's one of those books that um, such a great title, you feel you hardly need to read the book. It just kind of strikes the chord straight away. I would buy it, by the way, and I would read it because it's a great book. But, um, you know, it's just all in the title, isn't it? We plan, God laughs. There you go. Of course, not necessarily that easy to put into practice, to grasp that message in uh, in a meaningful way, um, especially when, you know, if you're like me, you, you're the sort of person who's utterly determined, focused on pushing forward uh, stubbornly with the plans that you, uh, you know, have, have got set in your mind. And uh, and yeah, sometimes, to be honest, I've I've been like that when if I just stopped and listened, I would find everything around me was saying, don't do it, you know, just chill. Uh, stop trying to make things happen. Um, just, just, just let it be. And um, this week I, I came across this picture, which I loved. It's fabulous, isn't it? And actually, I remember seeing something like this years ago, when we lived up in Teesside in Middlesbrough, and in a park there, there there's this tree. It's quite a big tree, that um, I don't know. Guess in Edwardian times or something like that, someone. Uh, had planted this little sapling and erected an iron fence around it to protect it from, I don't know, cows, dogs, children, whatever. Uh, the only thing is nobody remembered to move the fence away. So the tree just grew and grew and grew and basically gobbled up this metal fence, which is now kind of rather hideously sticking out from the trunk. It's the same thing here, isn't it? It's like um, we're going to have a pillar box here. Uh, but there's a little sapling tree sitting there right beside it with a big grin on its face saying, we'll see. <laughs> and I love the way the Royal Mail eventually got the message and sealed the mouth of the box. Although someone still paints it, which is good. You know, maybe sometimes we've just got to abandon our plans and uh, go with the flow. Have a laugh with God. Good, isn't it? So anyway, it's Advent, and one of the things that I'm looking at is Christmas icons. Not the usual Orthodox ones, but icons that rejig the picture of the Christmas story, which put it in a different context, which can be challenging, it can be disturbing. Um, but I think that's what the story is supposed to be doing. It's not something to put us all to sleep. The idea of this story is that it's something that should get under our skin. And so sometimes it needs to be put in a, in a completely different context. So we're going to look at some icons that are doing that during this uh, this this Advent period. And, and let's start with this one by Kelly Lattimore. I've shown you a couple of 
his icons before. It's called The Holy Family on the Streets. It's completely stunning, I think, and moving. I'm drawn, completely drawn in by the faces of these three figures. And obviously, as you see, it's a homeless family by a bridge with traffic no doubt whizzing by. Marginalised, shoved to the edges of society. But what the icon painter seems to be saying here is that um, this family is also precious and important. So he's used the same device that you find in conventional icons of giving them each a halo, that gold circle around their heads, which is saying these people are special, they're sacred, they're important. It's as if the icon is saying, not just in a family 2,000 years ago, God is present in every family, however poor or marginalised, and maybe especially in the poor or the marginalised. God lies not just in the nativity manger in the story, God lies in every cot. God lies in every mother's arms. Every family is sacred, holy. So look, if you've got a candle, we're just going to have a moment of candle lighting for families that are struggling. And it isn't just, you know, with poverty or homelessness. Maybe families are struggling with domestic violence or financial problems or with relationships that are just cracking up and breaking down, whatever. And you probably know a family like that, that's struggling in some way. So I'd like you to think about that family now, or maybe let this icon be a means of connecting you with families far away that you'll never know or meet, but who are still our sisters and brothers. So let's light a candle for families who are struggling and allow your heart to reach out to them today. And let's say for them and for ourselves, the Holy Shed Prayer of Serenity. God grant me the serenity to live fully and generously through circumstances I cannot control. Hope to keep on imagining better times for myself and the world and courage to change what I can instead of simply leaving it to others. Amen. So look, it's that time of year again, isn't it? Christmas, when we decorate houses, adorn Christmas trees, swap presents, eat and drink ourselves silly, spend a fortune on a single day. Oh yeah, and celebrate the birth of a child in a holy shed. The story is the centrepiece, of course, though sometimes looking around you'd hardly believe it. But here's the thing, is it true? As John Betjeman's wonderful poem asks, is it true, this story? And what does true even mean in this context? Questions I can tell you from experience which can get you into hot water in some circles. Oh, yes. Some of us remember the controversial uh, appointment of David Jenkins as the Bishop of Durham in 1984. The story made national news because of his so-called liberal ideas about miracles, the resurrection and the virgin birth of Christ. His consecration at York Minster was barracked by passionate believers protesting his blasphemy against Christ. Thousands of Anglicans at both ends of the spectrum who never normally meet evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics signed a petition condemning his appointment. But thankfully, from my view, the Archbishop of York at the time, John Habgood, basically told the world to clear off that he was completely cool with David Jenkins' position. <laughs> well, three days later, after the ceremony, uh, York Minster was struck by lightning. 
a sure and certain sign to the faithful of divine judgment. It's quite a fire, actually. But the ironic thing, you know, was that David Jenkins uh, wasn't coming up with anything new, you know. His uh, ideas had been commonplace in theology departments for pfft, a couple of hundred years, maybe more. And one third of the then House of Bishops, the already consecrated bishops, <laughs> admitted in a secret or a private survey to sharing his views. Be pretty good if it was that way today. Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> um but personally, I have to say, I found David Jenkins to be a delightful human being, uh, a very caring pastor, a diligent scholar, and against what many people would think, a dedicated man of faith. So anyway, this is it. We're going to focus on the virgin birth and other related issues over the next two or three weeks in the shed. But first this evening, I want to pull back a little bit to give a bit of background as to how I go about contemplating these things. If you've been in the shed over recent months, then you'll know that I've attempted not just to convey my own theological ideas, but also to share some of the principles that undergird them, you know, the, the, the things that have shaped how I've come to those ideas. For example, I've differentiated between what I've called, on the one hand, day language and night language. Day language pertaining to the realm of scientific or historical facts to rational or literal explanations. Night language, on the other hand, pertaining to uh, metaphorical and poetic wisdom, which really are not necessarily bothered with facts, but focus rather on the underlying meaning and significance of uh, whatever it is that's being thought about. Both types of language may be true, but in different ways. Uh, so modern history, for example, tries to give an accurate account of what happened and when, while poetry and art and symbol and metaphor look at events from a different perspective. They're less interested, as I say, in the facts. They're more focused on what the events mean. So, you know, if I'm looking for a precise or literal account of things, I don't ask a painting or a poem for that. I mean, that would be missing the point. Uh, but if all I have is historical facts, I might be missing the true importance of those events. I might not grasp the underlying significance of what's going on, which is what the world of art, and I think religion, properly speaking, concentrates on exploring. I've also talked in the shed about stages of faith, um, and, and I talked about an institutional or conformist stage of faith, which is where really our faith journey begins when we basically tend to fit in. We accept the status quo. This isn't a place to express doubt or to question things, uh, but basically to go along, to learn and to absorb. Scepticism here is, is seen as a bad thing. It's a betrayal of faith. But after a while, many of us find that this just doesn't work. It, it becomes unsatisfactory. And hey, those doubts in our heads just won't go away. They won't be silenced. So we subconsciously or consciously shift to what we call the individualist or the sceptical stage of faith, which, hey, might not look like faith at all because it's all about deconstructing beliefs. But trust me, doubt is not the end of faith. OK, it's actually a vital ingredient to faith. It's part of the faith journey. And if we persist in pursuing the journey with our doubts, we discover another stage, what we call the mystic communal stage. Where, as I say, we don't discard our doubts. We may actually even pursue them more vigorously. But we re realise that they're not the end point, that that's not what it's all about. We realise that there's something more, that there's that whole dimension of mystery, that there's a mysterious presence or reality uh, in everything. So we shift and we discover what we also discussed in the shed as a second naivete, a second innocence. It's a new way of understanding, a post-critical understanding of faith, not a pre-critical, which is what we probably started out with, but a post-critical understanding of faith. But uh, let's not get carried away here. Um, 
skepticism is absolutely vital to the journey. So, for example, I'm a Christian, but I'm also a child of the modern age, and I embrace that. I embrace both of them fully. Uh, as a child of the modern age, I can't possibly ignore the questions raised by the critical outlook. So, for example, genetic science dictates that virgin birth is an impossibility. It takes two parents to form a child. It would mean, if it happened, it would mean that Jesus had no normal genetic traits inherited from his male forebears. And, you know, even if a virgin birth were possible, we know that it could only result in a female child because there would be no Y chromosome from the, the male side, from male sperm. Now, I have been told on more than one occasion that following this kind of logic is basically unbelief. It's a betrayal of faith that God could miraculously implant male genetic traits, you know, presumably in the same way that God could bury loads of fossils in the earth to fool us into thinking that the world was millions of years old when it's really just a few thousand. You know, really, really? To be honest, in this day and age, I feel daft even having this conversation. How am I to believe in a God who supposedly invented the laws of science only to then trample all over them? I'm afraid, no, that's not for me. But here's the thing. Does all of this mean that Matthew and Luke's stories of the birth of Jesus are really just fairy tales? Naive, ancient babblings? No, 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 absolutely not. Um, and we'll get to that later. But first, let's get back to the business of day and night language. I've said before that I believe poetry, another form of night language, is the natural mother tongue of religious faith and truth. You know, so I don't read the Bible for historical facts, though I'm sure it does contain some. I don't turn to scripture for lessons in science, though, of course, there's science in the Bible. True religion no more competes with science and history than does art. That is just missing the point. There are two ways of looking, of perceiving. Both are crucial to a proper way of understanding things, but they're different. And you know what? This is a whole conversation that only occurs as a result of the Enlightenment, the 18th century Enlightenment. Fundamentalist literalism is a reaction to modern critical thinking, which arose from the Enlightenment. And imagining that critical thinking was an enemy to faith was and is basically a category mistake. They're different. They're different but not opposing forms of perception. It's literalism which uh, critical thinking opposes. Religious and atheistic fundamentalists, you know that there are fundamentalist atheists as well as Christians, don't you? I mean, not all atheists are fundamentalists, not all Christians are fundamentalists, but there are those crusading fundamentalist atheists. And, and these two things, religious and atheistic fundamentalism, are basically flip sides of the same coin, because both buy into the mistaken idea that for something to be true, it needs to be literally, factually true. So religious and atheistic fundamentalisms are basically the same thing. They're just coming from a different angle. But what an impoverished outlook they both share. Since neither understands or takes account of night language, militant atheists condemn the Bible as a pack of lies, while religious fundamentalists insist that the Bible makes perfect scientific sense when it doesn't. Both parties fall headlong into what we now call a category mistake. Like saying the colour green is a laptop <laughs> or the holy shed is a full English breakfast. Hello? That's just daft. Whatever we make of the virgin birth, it has nothing to do with Mary's biology. And to treat it at that as that is a category mistake, which then renders scripture completely absurd to the modern mind. I believe the virgin birth belongs to the realm of night language. The day language of facts and reason can't make sense of it. It's illogical, absurd, 
but night language digs beneath the surface of the story, a beautiful story, asking, as Mary asked the angel Gabriel, what does this mean? Now, I have to admit, you know, I love Christmas. You know, honestly, I'm not an old grump pissing on the bonfire. I love Christmas. And this year I'll be preaching at Midnight Mass in Streatham, live and online. I'll post the link when I get it. And I'm completely delighted about it because leading Midnight Mass at St Luke's for 19 years gave me back the soul of Christmas. I love the story, not because I think it's historically factual, but because it's a myth in the truest sense, a sacred story which is truthful and generative. It's, if you will, a midwife for the repeated rebirth of Christ in the world. I remember in my more zealous Christian youth correcting the carol Joy to the World. I sang Joy to the World, the Lord has come, instead of what it really says, Joy to the World, the Lord is come. It was a mistranslation, I thought. Surely the song is about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. But no, the words are right. Christmas isn't just a celebration about Jesus being born 2,000 years ago, which incidentally I believe is true. Christmas celebrates that Jesus is constantly being born. He comes again every Christmas and every day in between Christmases. This, this guys, is the main purpose, I believe, of this season, now Advent. Each year in Advent, we're invited to relive the yearning and the hope of ancient Israel. And each Christmas, we celebrate the Christmas fulfilment of that yearning. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. The purpose of Advent and Christmas is to bring the past into the present. O little town of Bethlehem, that's another great carol, which captures this sense of Christ's constant rebirth. I don't know if Jesus was born in Bethlehem or if that was really a way of Christians connecting his life and ministry to King David. I don't know. And you know what? I don't care. In night language, the carol emits an emotional sense of the story that grips me somewhere deep down. The story forges a place in our subconscious, the place where hopes and fears meet where we yearn and long for things that cannot entirely be put into words but find expression in the heartfelt cry O holy child of Bethlehem be born in us today. Well I'm sure these thoughts raise even more questions not least about the stories themselves in Matthew and Luke and I'd like to chew them over uh, in the next couple of holy sheds. Uh, and by the way, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook or send them to me and I will definitely take them into account. But, but I hope you hear clearly what I'm saying today. Yes, I look at this great story through critical eyes. I do indeed question its factuality, but not because I think the story is a fairy tale or unimportant or because the details don't matter. No way. My real interest is in what the story means, what it means for us today. I'm constantly asking with Bonhoeffer, who is Jesus Christ for us today? Along with the other half of his question, what Christianity really is. I mean, this question, what Christianity really is and who is Jesus Christ for us today, has haunted me for decades now and it still haunts me today and probably will to my grave. The answer to the category mistake about the virgin birth is to enter the story for what it is rather than what it isn't. It's not about the biology of a young woman. It's a beautiful, disturbing, deeply challenging, potentially life-changing, holy story. Well, that's what it is to me anyway. And we'll pick it up some more next week. But do send your questions or thoughts and uh, we'll carry on digging. Absolutely wonderful. So, look, we're going to toast 
our lovely broken world, our own lives in a moment. But first, we're going to uh, just say a prayer. So do join in if you wish to. We give thanks to your God for your love for the world. You look upon us all and still name us good. You conceive in us a thousand possibilities and carry us on into the timeless struggle in bringing to birth the reign of love in the world. We thank you for our brother Jesus who gave hope to ordinary people like us, crashing through the boundaries that separate us from life and from each other. With those who've gone before us and those who will come after us, with people of every time, place, culture and creed, we unite with all creation in the eternal hymn, saying, Holy, loving God, mystery of the universe, who cannot ever truly be named, heaven and earth are crammed with your wonder. Save us, we pray, from small minds and mean spirits, and fill us instead with passion for kindness and justice. Amen. So, grab yourself a drink. I know you've got one handy, because lots of you tell me you always have it there. And so, my dear friends, let us toast the glorious gift of life in all its beauty and diversity. Let us toast new beginnings, especially as we look toward 2021. Let us toast a future of love and justice and health for ourselves and our magnificent planet. Please raise your glasses and say with me, to life, Lachaim. wonderful well i think that you know there are lots of things that we can do to help this world along and uh thankfully through the internet we now have lots of opportunities through petitions and there's one i'd like to commend to you uh and i'm not making a particularly political point about this but i am appalled by the fact that our government is, seems to be set on course to cut the overseas aid budget so if you go to uh, my facebook page or i'll post it on holy shed as well you'll find a link to a petition that you can uh, sign appealing to the government to change their mind on this because we're one people in this world and i was a bit shocked really when Somebody in response to me putting this up put a comment that said, um, well, it asked the question, in the real world, question mark? Yeah, the real world is a world where we're all one and where we need to be part of helping those who live in other parts of the world whose need is greater than ours. So, hey, I know lots of the really good work that um, is done through this budget. So think about it, will you? And, you know, if you want to help me, <laughs> you can do so. You can support me on uh, the website Coffee by buying me a coffee or two. And um, I'm very grateful to those of you who are, who are doing this. Some of you are giving once a, you know, committing to once a month to give us uh, some support. It's much appreciated. And uh, another thing that you'll find is if you go to that website, Coffee, is that, you know, following a couple of requests of people asking if I could sign and personalise any of my books so that they could be given as Christmas gifts. Uh, I put all these books now on the coffee site. There's a, a, a sort of shop there. And if you message me with the name of the person you want to send it to, or maybe it's for you, just let me know that and I will write a message and send the book to you first class. Fantastic. So let's join together now in saying... The words of our blessing the blessing of god the eternal good will of god the shalom and salam of god the wildness and warmth of god be among us and between us now and always amen thank you thank you thank you dear people for being here in the shed with me this evening 
And um, I'm going to rush off and watch Liverpool now against Wolves. All you lovely Wolves supporters. And uh, <laughs> keep my fingers crossed. But um, have a good week. Look after yourselves. Go well. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye-bye.